Welcome to the Data Science Hangout, everyone. The first one since Posit Conf. Uh, for all those that I met, it was great meeting you. This is your first Data Science Hangout. Welcome. If this is your 100th or more, welcome. We're happy to have you. I'm filling in for Rachel Dempsey today. She's ordinarily the, the host. Um, she's taking a well-deserved vacation. Um, so I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, this is a casual, open environment for data scientists, data science leaders, interns, students, what have you. Um, so we want it to be a free-flowing conversation, super welcoming. So you know, use your best judgment, be nice. Um, there's lots of different ways to participate. You can um, chat in. Hannah will share a Slido link where you can ask anonymous questions. Uh, you can raise your hand, you can turn your video on, you can um, just sort of speak. So it's super casual, whatever works for you. Um, I'm really happy to introduce our leader today, Jean Vincent uh, from Nestle. Um, so I'll hand it over to him to do it to uh, do an intro and we'll get started. Okay, great. Thank you very much um, for the, the nice uh, intro. And uh, yeah, just to, to, to build on uh, uh, what, what you've just said. Um, so I've been assisting to, uh, uh, I would say, some of these, uh, these uh, uh, hangouts. Uh, honestly, it's, it's also sometimes collapsing, but it's in the end of the day here because I'm in Europe. So <laughs> that's why sometimes it's a bit difficult to attend. But I uh, just want to reiterate that uh, it's uh, really um, well, it's a pleasure for us to be here and to an honor, uh, honor to have been uh, asked to, to share my, my experience with you. Uh, and um, and just uh, I'm sharing then this experience as a person. So uh, just to make sure that uh, everyone is, is also aligned on this, I'm not uh, here representing Nestle as a Nestle employee, I would say, but I'm happy to share with, with my experience uh, throughout my um, different uh, companies also and, and, uh, and, and more recently Nestle, of course. Um, so speaking of which, I actually uh, medicated as a physicist. So I did uh, a physics in the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. Uh, and then after that, I did a PhD in, in neuroscience. So uh, where I have, uh, um, I was exploring uh, the connection uh, between uh, neurons uh, doing uh, so more, more biophysics and uh, that would be through electrophysiology. That's where I started to do some uh, data analytics, uh, more uh, rather uh, uh, heavily involved in, in uh, both uh, analyzing the signal to get uh, some relevant features out of that, and then uh, doing statistics to to get the, the, the yeah, what would be uh, uh, the what would be the uh, the message or the, <laughs> the learnings to get from that. Uh, basically, I was exploring how neurons were connecting and disconnecting uh, over twelve hour period. Uh, with uh, with actual uh, slices of, of tissue. Then after that, I moved to the industry and I started uh, to work as a process engineer in uh, Valtronic Technology, which is a company in Switzerland uh, with uh, also a, a production site in, in Solon in the US, um, so in, in Ohio. And um, I worked there uh, so as a process engineer in macro uh, electronics uh, to do assembly for medical devices. So we were working on uh, outside medical device, but also some uh, some implants, and that was it was a bit more challenging because, <laughs> uh, and that's where we have this um, uh, this uh, neuroscience also that was uh, interesting for for the company uh, with the neurostimulators. So I've been there uh, successively um, process engineer, then head of uh, engineering uh, and development, and then the head of technology, uh, taking care of the, 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 the portfolio of technology and interaction with customers. So uh, Valtronic is a service uh, company. So we don't have, the, the, we didn't have any direct product but we would uh, develop and industrialize products for customers. Uh, and then uh, after seven years in that company, I moved to Nestle as a data scientist. Uh, and then I, uh, there I worked in different projects uh, in the system technology center. So uh, it's located in Orp, Switzerland, um, where this, um, this is the center where we develop uh, all the well, so-called systems. So system is the, the, the conjunction of the machine, dispensing machine, the packaging, which is functional to some extent, more or less, but sometimes more than less, and the product. Uh, and uh, one of the most known is, is Nespresso. I would say uh, the Nespresso uh, system with the, the virtual lines that you have in the, in the US, or uh, we also have Dolce Gusto and uh, different things like this that are um, uh, around that. So I, I work there uh, really in different projects as data scientist uh, with uh, 
design of experiments uh, with uh, statistical process control, with also some automating uh, data analysis that were coming from the labs, where the lab would generate a lot of different files, and we would need to have some uh, apps that would then, uh, uh, and that would be shiny apps, then <laughs> that would be uh, 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 using uh, and analyzing the data to, to extract the, the, the knowledge of it, and then drive the, drive the development. And uh, recently, so this summer, I moved to Nestle Research. So moving a bit away from the production, I would say closer to uh, to more uh, uh, upstream uh, process in uh, research and development. Uh, and now I'm uh, still working in in, uh, in 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 programming and uh, having these um, on the, um, uh, more applied in the food science. And so it's uh, broader than just the, the, the systems three really touching all the Nestle categories there. Um, a side or say part of my activity also in Estland that could be interesting and that's why I'm sharing uh, it also with you because there might be some questions uh, also around that. Uh, I very early in Nestle joined uh, the uh, network. So we have knowledge networks in Nestle uh, in R&D where we actually see connect uh, different uh, people from different sites. Uh, just to give you yeah, an idea, um, I don't know exactly how many sites, but I think we have sites all over uh, the, the, the globe. Um, and uh, then sometimes the tax scientists are there, one of their kind, or maybe two of them. <laughs> and uh, it's good to connect so that we can share on experience, we can share on, on tricks, we can share on knowledge, and, uh, and also uh, get some, some coaching and, and, uh, and mentoring also uh, uh, each other. Um, so this data analytics network, I've joined when I joined it almost at the same time, and uh, more recently I've been in, uh, or in or for really for some time already in the leadership team, and for the past two years I've been leading that network, uh, so already coordinating the, the different activities for the net, this network in the uh, in, in Nestle. So um, uh, so voilà, that's a bit uh, about my history <laughs> in uh, in a in a short term. I don't know. I haven't looked at the. Uh, uh, at the questions, I don't know if you could spot some of the questions already, if there is any question on this. Question, questions typically come in, you know, maybe starting now. So if you have any questions, you know, please uh, type into the chat or uh, you can use the slide or you can just uh, hop on uh, with video and audio. I see Mike actually uh, has a question. Mike, nice to see you. <laughs> yeah. Hi there. Hi, jean Um okay. So what is the size of the data science group at Nestle? And I'm sorry if I missed this. Uh, well, I didn't mention, so that's a good question. Um, I would say that uh, it, it depends how you how you define data science. Um, typically, the networks, I will start from my close community or my closer to me. Uh, the, the network, uh, I mean, we are typically around 50. Uh, that would be for R&D, um, 50, 60, but not everyone is sort of completely exhaustive. And they more recently did uh, a data uh, science. Uh, so, and, and these people, I would say, would be more really in the in the development and now kind of hard coders. I would say also people either using R or or, uh, or Python or, or both. Um, but then, when you extend also to a lot of analysts, that could then be also using so more less coding or no code uh, solutions. Uh, it goes bigger, and when you look at also beyond R and D, I would say a number that came recently up is something like around a thousand. Uh, a thousand, knowing that Nestle is three hundred thousand people around the world, uh, including all the factories, of course. Uh, and then you can have a very diverse uh, approaches because we have people in the in the business who would be uh, more uh, looking at. Um, you know, dashboards, I would say it's really around the data visualization, which is already uh, teaching a lot. I mean, basically having a, just showing what is there. I mean, how many times I've got people coming to me with an Excel sheet and say, oh, we see this and this and this on the numbers. And I say, um, yeah, well, try plotting your data. <laughs> and that's one of the things we say uh, also in, in, the, in the, uh, the course we give is, is really plot the data. Uh, that's the, the, the first thing to do. So this is already very valuable. And uh, here typically using Power BI uh, type of solutions. So we have many people in the business doing this. There is also a lot of activity in the supply chain uh, that I've uh, heard of for, for all the demand planning and this kind of thing. So there, are, there have been things like this uh, and, um, and in various fields of, of Nestle. So that's why when you extend it beyond R&D, it, uh, it goes there, but it might be in, in also approaches and, uh, and techniques that I'm less familiar with. 
uh, as I'm much more uh, into, uh, I would say, um, um, technically generated data or uh, uh, yeah, um, machine uh, or instruments generated data. Yeah. If I may, can I have a follow up question then, Rob? So, of course. Um, if when you were talking about the communities to try to bring together um you know data scientists or practitioners then so is that primarily your 50 or is that actually reaching out broader no it's primarily the 50 i would say because it's it's really much more around uh doing the same activity um well we, we've seen here in the in the hangouts uh so we have some commonalities uh, across what the different activities of data scientists but uh we also have uh, might be quite different and i think that when you are treating um some some i don't know data for supply chain or uh, or human resource data uh or uh, data coming from a mass spectrometer uh it's not exactly the same so you have somehow the same techniques behind but uh also where we are more than just machine or calculating machines is because also we are having some knowledge about the domain uh and, and typically uh when i was uh, you know you know, I, I know uh, now, I think a lot about coffee also because I worked for coffee projects. And uh, when I uh, I was there, you know, it's really seeing the, connecting the dots also sometimes because you're like uh, people, they come with a request and they have a certain perspective from their project. And then also as a data scientist, you can say, well, look, I I understand what you, what you would like to do. And I can understand because I also know what is the context and what is the science behind uh, to some extent. I'm not pretending I'm at the level, but, to some extent, uh, we know this, this, uh, and then we can uh, we can help. So that's why this community, I would say, more in in R and D, which is already pretty a challenge to manage, um, because we see that we have uh, different uh, different um, uh, also approaches. Uh, you have to know that in in Nestle R and D, we have uh, so food science so as the, the most obvious or systems. Uh, then the product technology centers who develop the product that you wish to find on the shelves. Um, we also have then Purina, which is part of Nestle, that you may well know, and um, uh, but we also have health science. And typically in the Institute of Health Science, that uh, would be more things around, um, you know, uh, uh, more nutrients, so it's around intake, food intake, but it's also uh, regarding different uh, type of product that would be delivered in the hospitals, for instance, uh, and that would uh, then require different approaches and clinical studies and these kind of things. So it's already pretty diverse and that would have been that is still i would say a challenge to have uh, uh, sessions where everyone is interested in in the topic so sufficiently i would say um sufficiently uh how do you say that in english um sharp in technically uh but sufficiently broad so that <laughs> we are not lost by the by the science behind if it's not in our uh, more familiar domain so uh, so yeah Nestle is a massive company, right? Like I'm, I'm assuming most people are familiar with it, but Jean-Vincent, do you want to just sort of maybe give folks a lay of the land of like Nestle as an entity? Well, um, so I, as I've just said, to give a, a number, it's around 300,000 people uh, around the world. Uh, it's, uh, oof, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of factories. Uh, and then, um, when it has this particularity, as I said, that it's um, it, it's kind of so it's a Swiss base, the Swiss originally uh, from so the, the headquarters are in Vevey uh, in, in Switzerland uh, by Lake Geneva, which is called Lake Lemont. Uh, if you want to discuss Lake, <laughs> it's almost a whole debate on the region. Um, and uh, it's Swiss spirit in the sense that it's decentralized, uh, even though there is a center in Vevey, but there is always. Um, a, a will to have uh, products that are adapted to the local market. Uh, so there is a, some sort of autonomy that is also given to the different markets. So what we call a market is not necessarily a country, uh, but if it's a big country, it's just a country, but can be also a group of, of, some, uh, of some countries. Uh, and basically, well, it's, uh, I think, the first uh, food and beverage uh, company and our main products then are uh, around coffee. We are, we are producing a lot of, uh, um, of Nescafe, so typically it's one of the well-known brands. Uh, you may know also of, of Nespresso, uh, as I mentioned, also Purina uh, in, the, in the pet food. Um, uh, there is also all the chocolate, chocolate cayenne. I don't know if, uh, if it, uh, how, how, uh, um, how, how there is, um, uh, how it's uh, spread. Um, but they are also very, there are products that are typical to certain regions. Typically, I think Milo is South American. 
so then there are many, uh, sometimes many brands that uh, I'm, I'm even still discovering <laughs> that I didn't know existed. Uh, so so it's, it's pretty broad. So, but uh, really uh, supplying uh, food beverage uh, around the world, I would say. Yeah. And your, your previous company, Valtronic, is that, is that the yes, right word? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's, how, how different is Nestle from, from that company? Uh, well, you have different aspects. So first, Valtronic is 500 people uh, around the world. So it's uh, smaller than one center in Nestle. <laughs> so now in Nestle Research, we are more than 700 uh, located in, in Lausanne, around the Lausanne area. Um, and uh, so in that sense, it's, uh, it, is, uh, it, it was much smaller. So uh, of course, you can um, have also responsibility at a global scale uh, uh, much quicker, I would say. Uh, in, in a career there, um, but still it was international in the sense that Vartronic uh, has so the headquarters are in, in, in Switzerland. There is, uh, what well, there was at the time, a uh, engineering bureau in Romania, and then there was a factory in Morocco, still a factory in Morocco and a factory in the US uh, in Solon, uh, Ohio. Um, and um, uh, so there is still also this diversity because in the sense that, uh, so, the Moroccan company uh, plant was really to to produce uh, with a, 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 a less expensive um, a workforce, um, so it was more uh, decentralizing. Uh, but the U.S. company was a lot more autonomous and serving more the U.S. market. So there was also there also this uh, aspect of uh, of having uh, uh, this um, uh, serving the local needs, I would say, uh, from the company. Um, then it, it's different also in the, um, well, the activity also is a little bit different because we do not uh, we do not develop uh, electronic devices in Nestle, <laughs> whereas uh, Vatronic was really on electronic devices. Um, and uh, yeah, so I would say um, that there is also maybe the, the, the size of the company really makes a big difference in the sense that, uh, well, there are two things. First, uh, there, there might be some more constraints in Valtronic because it's medical. Uh, so aside from the medical part of Nestle, but and still Nestle is a food company. So there is a lot of constraints for around food safety, for, for instance, obviously. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, um, Nestle being a really big company needs to have you know, all of these processes that are inherent to every big company, I would say. And Valtronic was maybe a, a little bit more uh, on, uh, um, we can do different things um uh but yeah it's uh, still to, to to a certain extent so then uh, i would say it would be more directly closer to a startup even though while i'm saying this i'm also thinking that some part of nestle are also shaped to be uh like uh, i would say startup like or have this freedom so there is still even though there is it's a big company with all of the process and everything uh which is giving also a certain you know security and coherence uh then there is also uh, this uh, this uh, innovation uh and uh entrepreneurship that is uh, feasible into some some areas of the company yeah there is a an anonymous question asking what is the difference between your role as head of technology and now a data scientist I'm doing more hands-on things <laughs> as a data scientist. That's also one of the goals. You know, when you are head of technology, it's um, uh, the activity was a lot around supervising uh, people, um, not supervising in terms of people management, but more in terms of uh, technical uh, outcome that they were producing. And there was also a lot of activity around um, uh, interaction with the, the, the customers or with the, the, the prospects. So I would then work with the with the sales people, uh, and then uh, you know um, when they, they they would come to me, oh, I have this new guy who would like to do this and this. Do you think it's feasible? Um, I don't know if you if you're familiar with the with the, the the YouTube video where it says I'm an expert, I can do everything. You know, with these seven perpendicular lines uh, with blue ink uh, that are red. Um, for those who ring a belt, and then you would see these are the types of times of. You know, you're the, the head of technology, the, the expert coming in and, and then firsthand say whether it's possible or not. So, um, and in that regard, I'm not doing this anymore uh, at all as a data scientist in Nestle because I, I'm, um, uh, I, I'm involved in the project, I would say really much more hands-on. Uh, and I might then um, 
uh, th there is no um, interaction with, uh, I would say, customer who would have a specific project. It would be more internal customers and internal uh, projects that are being uh, shaped and, and, uh, and developed. So, um, yeah, so, so uh, there, there is this hands-on thing and I could really much more focus on data science activity itself. Uh, and develop also in that field that is uh, that is also taking off a lot with uh, uh, now more recently uh, also um, uh, on, on on larger uh, data sets as well. Very good, thank you. There was a question uh, posted by I think Niels. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced that, but Niels, I'll give you a second if you want to ask that yourself. Otherwise, I can ask it. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Thanks. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so my question was around, I, I think you mentioned uh, something about um, collecting some, some data files from the lab using uh, Shiny. So I was just wondering if you could talk about the process about, around identifying Shiny as the correct tool to do this, and then whether you had any interaction with the stakeholder to get approval for using it, and then... Um, as an add-on to that, uh, what development challenges did you meet, if any, uh, when using Shiny in uh, Enterprise? Thanks. Yeah, okay. So um, uh, basically, why using Shiny? It's because we're using R to start with. Uh, so uh, basically, the, the data analysis that I've been doing, so I've, uh, we have a, an internal package that is called Nestat, and that uh, I participated to in developing uh, some code around the uh, design of experiment analysis. Uh, and uh, so just to say that uh, we have a, a rather uh, intense activity uh, uh, using R uh, as, as the software for, for doing our analysis. Uh, especially when it comes to, um, you know, sometimes from the lab, you, you can have some more and more automatic, uh, automatic uh, or semi-automatic uh, um, equipment that could generate a lot of data, like photo samplers, yeah, like uh, robotic uh, systems and things like this. And uh, when it comes to that, you have uh, a lot of different files or, or a lot of files which are not so different. They are the same structure, but it's a lot of them. And, you know, um, copy pasting it in Excel and trying to do something out of that is uh, kind of uh, painful. Uh, and so uh, very quickly when I come to this situation, uh, I would then start coding in R to do the loading, automatic uh, data wrangling, put things together, have a nice graph with nice colors using ggplot and so on. Uh, so I'm a tidyverse fan, by the way. <laughs> and then, um, then, then with, with this, you have your code, and then uh, you get your colleague from the lab or from the project management saying, hey, uh, that's very nice, uh, but now I have new files and I would like to do it again. And the same analysis uh, and the same display and then and then over and over and over. <laughs> so after some time you say, hey, look, I can just package that into a nice web interface. Uh, and then uh, and then you can do it all on your own. And then if there is anything doing going wrong, then you can just let me know and I will uh, I will also uh, I will also then uh, update it. Uh, other things that could happen, typically to give you an example, why we've been doing this is um, so. Well, you it's not a secret that a coffee machine is is pushing water through a system, and then with water you have also some pressure, and then so you have some curves of pressure against time or temperature against time, this kind of thing. And then we are interesting uh, to uh, interested in what is you know, the maximum here, what is the plateau here, what is the local minimum, what is the local thing, and what is the variability. So all these features uh, extracted that are, uh, then they are interested into that, and then they would run their own analysis on the features, but they need to extract these features. And a typical Shiny app would be uh, something where they could upload the raw data and then get back a CSV file where they have the features analyzed uh, and extracted. So now, how did we manage to have this uh, in the company? Um, so I would say a key thing is to have a, a good a good relationship with IT <laughs> because they are the, the guardians of the compliance for IT and it's really important and, and for very good reasons, <laughs> especially in a company as exposed as, uh, as big companies, I would say any big company. Um, and uh, what it, it went, so the, the first thing that 
I mean, at some point I had also, you can also have shiny apps that you just like locally deploy in, 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 in the computer. And then you can also uh, have your uh, colleague uh, having uh, R and in, installed. And then you can just, uh, we started by this sometimes, by the way, to have a kind of um, uh, a bash file to uh, just start the process and they would double click on it and then it would open automatically uh, R and shiny behind and then they would have the, the, the page. But then it's sitting on their computer and if we want to update anything, then we need to, to go to their computer again. Uh, so there were some discussion also already from, from the center where people saying, oh, that would be interesting. And then, uh, you know, connecting with IT, you, you manage to put it into the sufficiently secure and closed environment, but still available in the intranet. Uh, and then more recently, we uh, moved uh, with Azure and then uh, then it goes into uh, into Azure uh, with Azure solutions. Um, uh, and, uh, and then that's also where you can manage the access, you can manage uh, the visibility of the, the, the virtual machine. So now we choose the server is, is, is about the virtual machine. And uh, and yeah, so the, the thing is to have uh, our uh, IT uh, counterparts uh, that are uh, uh, aligned uh, with, with, with us. So basically what we I was looking at, I could describe the needs that we had as, as a programmers and data scientists. And then they would, uh, they, they, they came back with some proposal and then we moved together to, to have something that's up and running. Um, so, uh, I don't know if I covered uh, the, the the whole question because you, you asked me also. Uh, uh, yeah, how how do we? Uh, is there any well hurdles in the big company? Yeah, we said it's just is um, having the, the right the right people, but it's also a matter of um, of uh, of good compromise, I would say, because of course you you are not uh, in a world as uh, open source, and or you would not you know. Um, Typically, our code is version into a Git system, but inside, in-house, we would not put our code on GitHub because it's a private company. Uh, so you need to to have this uh, this understanding, and then uh, you know also explaining what are the needs that we have. Typically, in R and D, we have some needs that are um, inherent to research and development. We, we cannot predict what we will discover because it's research and development. I mean, so that, and and sometimes this is a bit uh, you know. Um, difficult to uh, to handle when you speak with people who are used to uh, deploy an app and the app is doing what it's supposed to be doing and we know and we know everything and there is no doubt and that goes with it so there was also these discussions around that to really understand each other's needs and perspective because you cannot either uh, go freely like say uh, I'm r and I'm creative, I want to do everything and, and, and voila, no, no, you need to play also by the rules for the good reason and understand, understand them. Regarding your comment about good relationships with IT and Travis, I see you uh, made a comment. We do hear that a lot. I like to sort of ask like, what are some concrete steps or things that you can do to actually build a good relationship with IT, because sometimes it can be a, a statement akin to like deliver a great customer experience. It's like, okay, well, what does that actually mean and look like? Um, I would say, yeah, the the good relationship with IT is, um, I would say, like any human relationship, it's uh, understanding also the the other's perspective. Uh, it's it's really, um, you know, most of the time really in the very vast majority uh, when someone is is bothering us uh, with some constraints it's not by pleasure or just to make our life worse it's because they they need to deliver on something and in, they are also accountable for something and then uh, we need to uh, to to make sure that uh, um, that we also speak the same same or not same language but at least we have the, the common ground of understanding so i would say that would be one of the key things i mean uh, I remember, like for instance, um, uh, yeah, th th there might be things that you are not aware of. Uh, uh, typically, on on some of the data access or some of uh, of the, the the systems access, you say, yeah, I would like to have it open, you know, in the the, the words of sharing, sharing knowledge, sharing science, sharing everything, uh, and then they say, yeah, but you see, uh, this and this can happen, and actually did already happen, and you didn't know that. So listen to the stories also that they have to tell us uh, where it comes from, all these uh, these uh, frame that was put in place, and and afterwards it's even better because 
once once it's uh, it's well set, then you can really work uh, in in a confident manner in in a, in a safe environment. So uh, yeah, I would say understand, listen to to the other, but also uh, be able to explain your your perspective and your needs uh, in in a, in a uh, in a most objective way. I would say in a, in bottom line is to to say <laughs> to say yeah, I need to. This is how I uh, I, I see and and I see someone is commenting one good relationship with IT, do not lose patience. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I think patience is also a, a good thing, but uh, um, but yes, I'm not saying I'm succeeding every time. Sometimes I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, you know, passionate, I would say. <laughs> but uh, yes, it's uh, try to to understand also their perspective. There, are, I want to go to the anonymous questions. There's a, a few of them. Um, one is, do you miss supervising people? Do you still supervise people? I find that it seems like an inevitable path to progress, but I don't know if I'd be any good. Uh, that's a good question because that's exactly one of the reasons I moved uh, also to Nestle. Uh, so I think it's inevitable to do some sort of supervision. Uh, now, uh, the, the great thing as uh, as uh, I've, I've uh, have the chance to have in Nestle that we have a path where we can develop expertise. And that's what I've chosen. So I'm not developing into managing more and more people, having a group than a department than an institute or whatever. Uh, I'm, I'm more developing the expertise in data science. But still, with a certain level of seniority, you people come to you and ask you for help, ask you for uh, feedback, ask you for having some, you know, uh, can you have a look at what I've done and then tell me. And then also people would ask you, well, from your perspective, what strategic decision would you recommend? So, you know, at some point you take this also uh, span uh, when, 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 when you uh, grow in, uh, in the career. So um, that's why I say it's inevitable to, to do some sort of management. So I would say I, have, I more have um, I don't have direct report as of now, uh, but I have uh, you know indirect or dotted line type of, of relationship also. I may supervise sometimes some uh, some students or uh, or in in case like this, uh, but it's it's more um, uh, yeah something uh, I would say like uh, uh, coaching and and counselor uh, type of uh, activity. Um, still with the responsibility that goes with it because I've got the experience sometimes that uh, I've got some feedback where uh, um, yeah, senior leader would ask uh, some project manager to, who is presenting the project. Uh, so these are the conclusions. And then, uh, oh, did you check it with Jean-Vincent? And then if they say yes, then you say, oh, okay, <laughs> that's fine. So you kind of the, 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 the validation of the expertise and it goes with the responsibility because if it fails behind, then that's somehow also your credibility that is at stake. So, uh, but I would say that, yeah, um, that's really something that, uh, that, that is uh, occurring, I would say, in, in, in any career. There was an anonymous question. I think it referred to a previous conversation. It's what is a head of technology? I guess the implied question is like, well, what does that entail? But, well, that is exactly in this line of not having a typical di uh, uh, direct report. Um, I, I, at the time, I was uh, transversal into the different uh, groups. Uh, and um, so I would be the go-to person if there was a technological question uh, in, in the company. Uh, and then uh, also uh, trying to coordinate across uh, the different groups, the different, uh, different activities. Uh, so that would mean, uh, you know, reviewing what the different engineers are doing, uh, giving them also some uh, so, some feedback on 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 the on, on the results they obtain, and uh, maybe also some guidance on how they would do the next experiment or how they would uh, uh, address the next uh, uh, process uh, challenge, um, and then. Uh, yeah, also being the counselor uh, for a uh, relationship with outside. So when someone is coming and saying, uh, okay, I would like to do this new implant with that technology, uh, do you think you can bring me a solution with this? And then uh, with having discussed with all and having an overview of all the project technology speaking uh, in, in the company that you can have a good uh, insight and saying, well, we think we can do that this uh, in that way, in that way, or uh, uh, with this and this uh, challenges or in that time frame and so on. So that would be also the, the type of uh, uh, activity. 
There was a question, and sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, from Pankaj. Um, I don't know if you want to join in. I see you're on, I see you're on video if you want to join in, but I'm happy to ask it as well. Hi. Hi, hi. Uh, yeah, uh, John, thanks for the insightful uh, things that you have been telling. It's really helpful. My question was more around uh, Shiny application that you're using. Uh, what kind of database or data store or data warehouse would you typically suggest uh, as a backend for Shiny application? And uh, majorly when there is a huge scale, we are talking about like 100, 200 GB data uh, in the backend. Well, that's a question maybe for some of the positive people online also that would uh, give you a, 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 comp a more complete answer. Um, uh, to be really transparent, I, I'm not dealing with that big databases, um, but from what I know that, uh, that, that we have been using uh, uh, there, I would say our chosen solution uh, is around Azure. So I would say a cloud-based uh, solution is, is something that, uh, that would, uh, that would uh, be, um, I would say the preferred solution because you would not download 200 gigabytes on your, on your laptop. <laughs> it's not, that won't work. And you need to also to scale up your, your computing power, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, I think something that is uh, really a big advantage of, of cloud solutions in general. Uh, they have this flexibility of, of computing power. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how much for shiny apps you can handle that uh, size of databases, uh, but definitely what you can do also is have some backend pre-processing because depending on what you want to display, I mean, in the end, you may not want to display the, 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 the hundreds of millions of points. You want to display some summary data, some, some knowledge extracted from it. So I would, uh, I would then, from what I know, I mean, this uh, I would maybe use things like you know Databricks or uh, or, or Data Factory uh, in Azure. I don't know about um, about Amazon and, and Google Cloud, so that's why I'm speaking about this one. So I'm not you know selling anything. It's just that I'm speaking what I've experienced. And then you can prepare your data, and then your Shiny app can then uh, um, get the, the 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 relevant data that is uh, that is uh, then useful for for this plane. So. And it depends also on the, on the application because why I'm saying this, maybe you want to recalculate some things based on the full data set, depending on what is the user, the, what is the user input. But I would really um, try to, um, to take care of having as much as possible uh, pre-processing data with things that where you can call uh, very, comp uh, very, very uh, powerful clusters. Uh, I, I don't know if you, if you imagine a situation where you have some data and then maybe once a day or once every 24 hours or twice a day, you would have, you would turn on the very powerful cluster that is a lot expensive, prepare your data, uh, save it somewhere in a data lake or in a um, structured database. Shiny works well with, I've, I've done some Shiny application with, uh, with, uh, with cloud, uh, with, um, with um, yeah, Azure data lakes. So it's really like a file system. Um, but you can also work with uh, with SQL database very very well that are in the, in the in the cloud. There is also some uh, uh, you can work with uh, with Cosmos DB that are a bit more flexible. But then I would imagine something like where you have your big storage, then your data bricks would in R and Python you can do both. You can uh, then would query and then get your data, analyze, save it in a way that is prepared for the shiny app, so that the shiny app is a lot more reactive when it has really the minimal data it needs to, to be efficient and to serve the, the need. Uh, so it really depends on, on what you need. Um, because if you want to program or to get to recompute everything every time you have a query or, or reactive action that is done on your app, then it will very likely crash uh, quite quickly. So, so I would, yeah, prepare this in that way. Understood. Thanks. Thanks a lot, John. Ahmad, I see your hand is raised. Yeah. Um, I had a quick question. Um, so a little bit about my background is beforehand, I used to um, have no coding experience whatsoever. I had to learn as a means to an end. And so I just had a data camp subscription and was frantically searching on Stack Overflow before my deadlines. And uh, the experience that I had was a little bit stressful. And to be quite frank, I was a little intimidated, um, sort of uh, stepping into this newer space, a more technical space. And so Jean Vincent, I'd love to get your perspective on if you've had any experience with coaching and helping other people lower the barrier to entry 
in terms of uh, learning how to code, learning how to apply code, coding principles to their data science work, because the initial uh, barrier can be a little, um, a little daunting, a little scary at first, at least in my experience. Um, so I'd just love to hear your experience about playing that mentor role and if you have yeah. any tips and tricks for us. Um, yeah, sure. So um, first I would say, uh, the, the, the key thing is that the, the person starting should be uh, well. I think if you are interested into the into coding, then that's that's a very good first step. People there is the first barrier is people. Some people are scared by the code, and and some are not. So if you are scared, I would recommend you do something else. But if you are not, then it's a good it's a good thing. <laughs> and then I would say, um, yeah. Maybe two, three uh, tricks, but uh, maybe they're, they're kind of obvious. You, you can uh, have some example code. Typically, you never, you rarely start from nowhere. So you, you always have more or less good quality. I mean, I uh, well, so I, I started also coding in my life. I didn't. I was not born coding. So <laughs> so, so uh, sometimes some of the other people would then give me some 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 part of code that was okay and then i could start reading it and understanding it and then uh, adapting it so you can have a first thing is that this is your example code and then uh, and then adapt it so maybe having a colleague that can give you also some things and then uh, something that is that is really um i would say helping is to do not hesitate to have regular sessions like weekly where you just review the code and uh even or if you have a question then you can go uh yes yeah, stack overflow or uh, yeah, I'm not sure that uh, that ChatGPT is doing a very good job. I've had some hallucinations <laughs> in there, so double check with the internet as well. Uh, then it can help, and and then you can you can. But I've I mean I've stuck overflowed a lot, of course. Um, and then uh, then it's it's good to have it's good to have also this session. Let's take an hour or two hours, uh, sometime in the week. We sit together, explain me your code. Uh, that's where there are the different intentions. Comment your code. I would say also don't hesitate to put comments even for yourself. This is what I'm doing here. This is what I'm doing here. And this is, you know, just a, a few a few notes. Uh, and, um, and and then with someone more experienced can then uh, propose some, some uh, alternative way of doing the analysis or alternative way of uh, uh, or more efficient way. And... Um, yeah. Uh, so, so in terms of, of coaching, is there, there, there is this um, because yeah, sometimes it happened to me that you know, I get uh, I get um, to review a code with someone, and then uh, we say, yeah, but you, you can do it a lot more efficient this way. So it's not only a matter of being you know computationally efficient. Sometimes yes, because it takes several minutes or hours to compute. So you you better have something more efficient that is really dramatically uh, uh, reducing. Uh, but sometimes also it helps also the code to be clearer. And then if you have a elegant uh, coding, then in the end, you also have a better understanding of what is happening and, and you, you keep track and you, you avoid hidden mistakes because in the code, you can have uh, cases where um, uh, the, the code doesn't work and it gives you an error. That's kind of easy. You have a capital letter somewhere that was not there. You don't have the right package. Okay, that's kind of quickly fixed. But I would say the most problematic error is when it does everything and then it outputs something that is not supposed to output. <laughs> and if you cannot spot that, that's that's pretty complicated. So what that's when you have a clear code and, and an elegant code, you can you can more easily follow, I would say, what is going on. Uh, and typically, uh, yeah, that, that's where things like uh, uh, what we have in yeah in, in, in tidyverse again or with the pipe and these kind of things and you can have something that is a lot uh, uh, easier to, to to follow and um, and sometimes what can be good also is to set some challenges uh, and I set myself at some point I said now from now on my code in R will have zero for loop I did everything without for loop first it's more efficient. And sometimes it helps you also think a bit differently. <laughs> but with apply, uh, typically with everything around uh, uh, apply map uh, map to the uh, map whatever you have, uh, the map DFR map the uh, uh, then uh, you can do a lot of things and uh, and then you have uh, this um, this uh, also a, a way to uh, to to have um, to have something that is, is working. 
And I would say um, it also helps developing the functions aspect. So it's, it's also good to say, okay, I can have a function doing this, a function doing this, and you, you build your, your code that this way. It's also in the clarity part. So this function is taking my data from this to this, and then I have the next thing to take into this to this, then I can apply it. I, I, I say Jeff is not, uh, do not agree with me. Yes, <laughs> it's not more efficient <laughs> to use. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, clear. There is this parallelization that you can use. Um, but but uh, well, I, I had some examples um, that actually was, uh, was uh, where we have more efficiency. We can, we can debate this in a specific thing. I think that could be. Uh, there, there is one thing that is uh, a lot, a lot efficient. Uh, is uh, however, don't forget that R is using uh, is um, uh, I mean use matrix calculation. So typically, uh, the worst thing to do is to scan through a data frame <laughs> uh, because uh, and always think that you can use the object and and uh, and manipulate them as such. Travis, I see you asked a question, and I'm very curious. Where are you dialing in from? <laughs> Oh, San Diego, back back uh, home, I guess these days. Um, I don't. I admittedly don't know a lot about food science, um, but I'm so I'm in the pharma side. And the notion of whether or not you have to submit data products or um, kind of reports to the FDA or other regulatory agencies, um, do you have to do so? There's a lot of conversation in the pharma biotech world about how to do these things with R. Um, it's often met with some resistance just because they're more used to seeing SaaS. Um, I wonder if that's a thing you've had to come across. Oh, well, I haven't personally come across this. Um, uh, I, I know some people who are SaaS is also a software we use uh, in, in Nestle. I'm, I'm not personally using it, but it has been used. Um, I'm not in that part of the, the, the process. So um, fortunately, I cannot give you uh, any details on this. But there are, um, there are clearly uh, a lot of activities around, around that anyway, uh, because we have food safety specialists. And we have even an institute that is dedicated to food safety. Uh, so, uh, so this is really something uh, that's there. But I, um, probably they've been doing some mission also to FDA, uh, especially if we speak about health science uh, development. Uh, but beyond this, I'm, I'm afraid I, I don't have any <laughs> any experience in, in that in that regard for, for this. So. Yeah, no worries. Thanks. No, it'd be interesting. Um, you know, as as a follow up, sometime if, you know the the conversation I think is often dominated by the pharma and biotech world. Um, but I imagine you all struggle through the same sorts of things um, on the food science and health science side. I'd be interested if we all chat together. You know. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Let's burn through a few anonymous questions. Um, how much freedom do you have regarding the tools that you use? Um, mm, as much as I can justify the need, I would say in, in a sentence. <laughs> um, it's true we cannot use anything we want. Uh, we need to use approved uh, tools. Um, but as far as I'm concerned from my day-to-day -day work, I have uh, a lot of them. So I have a lot of tools and I have, uh, uh, I would say, more than if enough uh, uh, tools to use. Sometimes I come across things I would like to implement. Uh, and then, yeah, the process is um, we, we can come with a proposal, but then we, we first need to come with a, with a requirement. We, we, need, we need to do this and this and this. And these two answers my needs because of this and this and this. And then uh, IT would come back and tell me, well, maybe you can use this. Uh, which we already have in house that I was, and sometimes it happened. I was not aware of something, and then I, I, I have a, a new tool I can I can use um, that is actually answering the need. And if really uh, there is uh, there is a good reason for uh, uh, for having a new tool, then then that's uh, it's still okay. I mean, it can be approved, and uh, and then and then we can move on with uh, with it. And I double click and ask what what is the um, if you can share the process for. A new tool, right? So you discover something; it's amazing. You you want to use it. How do you go about, you know, bringing that into the workplace? Or what advice might you give to others? Well, I, I, again, as uh, coming back to IT security, I would really um, uh, come to um, first talk to uh, to IT uh, representative to say. Um, 
I would not come saying, I have this new tool that is great, please buy it, because that won't work. <laughs> so I would come say, hey, you know, I've come across this challenge in my, uh, in, in my work, and uh, do you know anything about uh, that could uh, help me with this uh, particular uh, challenge? I have that, by the way, is answered by the tool I've found out. Uh, and then in the conversation, you can maybe suggest it and see whether it, they, they, they know about it or not. So because it's a lot more, you know, okay, saying, and you, you can say, I, I may have a potential solution, but this is really what I need to have uh, at first to be, to, be, um, uh, to be answered in terms of, of, of need. Uh, and then you can, you can propose a tool. I think what's, um, how, how do you navigate the, the line or sort of adopting open source tools, right? A lot of the times they're they're free. So you can just sort of, you know, download them. Maybe there's not a purchase necessary. How do you go about, or how do you navigate not over-involving IT, but keeping them in the loop? Um, well, first, some of these free uh, tools, they are already, uh, many of them are, have been approved because, you know, IT is kind of also, uh, is doing the, the, their job in terms of uh, scouting and being a, uh, uh, aware of what is, is going on. Typically, with uh, uh, we have the example with, with ChatGPT, and you know what happened with uh, with Samsung. Uh, so uh, very early, we had uh, also some communication internally saying, uh, "We know there is this coming out. Please be careful uh, about this and this." Um, so technically, we are not. Uh, if it's an open source and free tool. Uh, that doesn't require admin rights to uh, install on your machine. <laughs> you can do it, but then you're responsible for it. I think this freedom also always comes with responsibility. Uh, so um, I think it's okay. And if you if you address it this way, also with uh, uh, with the, the, the with IT, uh, who, who is also responsible for the for the overall security of the of the company. Uh, then um, uh, then I, it goes in the right direction because you say. Uh, uh, look, I would like to use that. Uh, it's always good to have a double check and maybe uh, ask the question. You can test it on your own personal computer at home. Say, ah, I've done some tests at home and uh, it looks good because of this and this. Uh, what do you think uh, applying it uh, into the into this? Uh, and if you have this reflection, so you may not need to, for each and every step, go to, to them. But um, if you have behind also uh, the reflection also, okay, what would be, you know, kind of doing a sort of a light risk assessment uh, also regarding the company and taking into consideration the company's uh, need and perspective. Uh, then uh, after some time, you get used to it and say, okay, maybe this, I'm pretty confident I can do some tests and, and have some reflection and then you can just double check. Um, and some other things you would ask uh, from staff because, you know, it might not be uh, so straightforward. And, uh, yeah, just make sure that... Um, that you have also this uh, kind of, you know, rational and reflection on, on this. Very good. There is a, I want to make sure we get to all of the anonymous questions. So we're coming to the top of the hour. So if you have any uh, burning questions, submit them on Slido or put them in the chat. But uh, one that we didn't get to so far is what are your aspirations for the future in your role, in your role or longer term? Well, that's, um, it's an HR question. <laughs> uh, no, it's really, I, I think I, I'm really interested into uh, this whole uh, field of, um, uh, well, basically trying to get knowledge, you know, extract the knowledge and understanding of the phenomenon uh, from, from, the, from, from the data. And we have more and more data. So I would say uh, really growing in, 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 in this and being also a uh, uh, aware of what is uh, what is uh, what is is emerging. I mean, recently we have, uh, if you look a bit in in the history, we have been uh, uh, having some some statistics and then uh, doing some uh, linear regression. Or then you came to random forest, and now we have transformer architecture that can be applied beyond uh, text uh, in, in in some cases. So uh, you know, getting more of these things and and trying to to connect the dots between the different uh, things that. Uh, that are available or that emerge also from from the academic research um yeah to i would say uh, continue in, in that field so uh, then uh, by doing this it it's uh, in terms of personal uh, you know um, uh, development um typically in the expert uh, in the expert uh, expertise aspect you can 
then start to also give lectures in, in some uh, universities or in some schools and then to see, uh, to also share the, your, your knowledge here and get the feedback also from, from, from different, uh, from the students and from different people. So I, I would say uh, that would be a natural evolution. You know, it's also to, to go to reach beyond the company uh, for, for this. Uh, and which is by the way aligned with, uh, with the, the, the company also, uh, uh, the company policy. Very good. So I think that wraps up the uh, anonymous questions and I, I don't see any outstanding ones in the chat. Obviously, feel free to raise your hands, everyone. Um, I like to typically end or, or ask, like, not to put you on the spot, but I guess to put you on the spot, what advice do you have uh, for data scientists or aspiring data science leaders? Leaders in, uh, in particular, um, yeah. Well, you have many different uh, angles here, but if I, uh, I had to pick one, um, uh, I would say um, it's evolving uh, very, uh, very, very fast. So I think uh, being curious on new things and uh, always trying to, uh, well, with moderation, of course, because you need uh, also to, to deliver and to be to be efficient. So I would say, uh, yeah. Uh, be, being curious about what, what is coming up and, and, and the new discoveries and then uh, um, don't hesitate to, to, to test these new things on uh, to see if it performs better than the current uh, techniques that you would have so far. Um, but then also um, keep the, as a leader, keep the right balance between having new things and still also letting the time for the people that you are maybe leading uh to, to learn about them and, and to still deliver in what they have to do in the everyday life because you know sometimes uh you have to uh you, you have these new things that you want to try but still the projects are moving on and and good old statistics or class, more classical approaches also deliver well so there is a good balance to find between between the, the how to deliver with what you know already but still having this curiosity and, and openness to, to try new things that may uh, also open some new opportunities are there any particular avenues or channels that um, you use and occupy to stay up to date and, and learn new trends? Well, uh, I would say uh, I, I get um, some some news uh, some news that are coming uh, from you know um, uh, what should I? Uh, I'm not registered to a specific journal. I would say it's more you know scattering <laughs> uh, like this. Um, Sometimes also, it, it, there is no one channel, I would say, really. It's, it's really uh, a therapy. To, as you asked the question, I realized this because, you know, sometimes I get something on LinkedIn and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And then I pull the thread and then see what, what, what's there. Or some other time uh, we have a specific challenge to solve in a project and then uh, there is a company or then that we can work with. Uh, then that would be the thread I would pull, you know, to, to better, uh, to, to better uh, understand it. So I would say, it's really more opportunistic and systematic way, uh, I would say. But maybe that, maybe I could change this. That could be a good, <laughs> but uh, so far it goes that way. Very good. Well, we are at the top of the hour. So jean Vincent, thank you so much for your participation and, and leadership today. If folks want to ask you uh, more questions or get in contact with you, um, what's the best way to, to uh, connect with you? Well, I would say LinkedIn, LinkedIn, uh, but uh, don't. Uh, I mean, just um, be careful to um, send a small note that uh, it was during the posit talk, uh, posit uh, hangout, uh, because uh, you know I tend to uh, to to not accept LinkedIn <laughs> uh, contacts if I don't know the person uh, or I haven't met. You know, it's kind of a, a rule I set for myself because you know otherwise you get overwhelmed. So. Don't hesitate to connect, but uh, leave a leave leave a, a word, uh, and uh, and then uh, then we can uh, most probably I will come back to you saying, hey, let's have a chat, and then and then we connect. <laughs> so we it It's a good rule. <laughs> That's right, but include a note. Uh, very yeah. good. It was, it was nice seeing everyone. Um, next week it'll be regularly scheduled program with with Rachel. But uh, Jean Minson, thank you so much. I hope everyone has a great rest of the day and week. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for answering your questions. Talk to you soon. See you all. See you. Bye-bye.